welcome to the Untrapped Podcast. I am your host, Keith Kelfus. What's up, guys? This is Keith Kelfus with the Untrapped Podcast. And on today's show, we've got Daniel Miraval, certified arborist from Chicago. Dude, what's, what's up, up, bro? It's awesome to have you here on the show. And so if you guys are looking to... Uh, Maybe become a certified arborist or learn more about tree work, tree care, safety. If you do lawn care, landscaping, whatever you do, this guy is definitely, he's the expert. He's quickly raising up, rising up as an industry, uh, an influencer in the industry of arbor culture. And he has many certifications and, and just his knowledge is very extensive to the point of it, he'll scare you when it comes to being what he calls a proactive steward of the urban environment. And so you've been very busy, man. I've been very busy. I feel like I just got off tour. It's What's crazy. Man, I, I've been doing a lot of conferences, a lot of classes, not to make this all about me, but um, I just was elected to the, uh, to the board of the Illinois Arborist Association, the commercial director, the commercial chairman um, of the Illinois Board of Directors. The commercial chairman. Yeah. Two-year position, so I'm pretty excited about that. So basically that position kind of represents the commercial side of uh, tree care. So that's pretty wow. exciting. Yeah, we're trying to get people to come into the organization, become members, uh, take advantage of the advanced training classes we have. So I've been spending a lot of time going to a lot of conferences, a lot of classes, um, especially for the people who write the books uh, um, that people that we recommend that people uh, read if they're going to get certified as an arborist or increase their knowledge. I've actually been going to conferences where these people who wrote the books um, are teaching live and in person. So, plus, you know, doing a lot of networking, a lot of good people in the industry, man. Guys, hey, let me see that plant behind you real quick on that shelf. You want to see it? Yeah, I just want to bring something in tactical. Like, this is the level this dude is at. See this? Imagine this is a real plant. You're going to prune it. You're going to trim it. You're going to cut it. You're going to plant it in the ground, whatever. His level of knowledge down to the, the molecular bi biological level of is if you trim this and you don't sanitize your trimmers in between. Pruners saw, yeah, you can pass uh, disease onto other trees. Yep. From plant to plant. Like you could be held liable even if you trim somebody's tree and, and it dies or something like I just put it back. <laughs> um, uh, when I met him. It just blew my mind how much stuff that I wasn't aware of. And to talk about that, how important this is. Well, it's really important, especially like in, in the Midwest with oaks, um, not just in the Midwest, but we're in the Midwest. So I refer reference that, hey. but, there you go. but, uh, Oh, that's much better. But uh, you uh, like oaks, for example, you prune an oak at the wrong time of the year, you know, in the growing season, and it's a higher risk of uh, it getting an infectious disease, which it actually can uh, uh, graft toward other, other trees. If you have roots that are grafted together, it can transfer from one tree to another tree. You can have a whole row of them uh, die. So you might trim, uh, prune an oak tree, let's say in July, which is the wrong time of the year, and uh, it gets infected. Uh, because of that process, and then it, gra it, it it transfers to the roots of the other tree on someone else's property, and down the line, you could be in a lot of legal trouble. You know, it's pretty bad. So we need to get uh, familiar familiarize ourselves with those kinds of issues, and that's why being a member of a professional organization, you know, you can take some advanced classes, learn about that, go to some conferences. What an so. example of some conferences people can go to if they want to learn more about this? <clears throat> Um, your local um, International Society of Arbor Culture chapter. So it depends what part of the country you live in. Um, Mid-Atlantic, for example, is a Mid-Atlantic ISA chapter. Illinois has its own standing chapter for the state. I think Florida does as well. You have the West Coast, which has multiple states in it. California, actually Hawaii is in there too. Um, I think Texas, Nevada, there's a few states that are in that uh, Western chapter. You have some Midwest um, states that are in one chapter. Uh, I just came from the Wisconsin Arborist Association chapter. Shout out to the cheeseheads up there. You guys showed me a good time. Uh, that was a really well put together conference with a lot of a lot of leaders that were in there. Good stuff. And I'll put a link in the description below of, to the one in Champaign, Illinois, that where he did a live demonstration of a root collar excavation. Mm -hmm. A very powerful video, very inspiring. I mean, the stuff that you're talking about, even on your Instagram. What's your Instagram handle? Uh, green Extraction. I think it's just green extraction on Instagram. And then my own personal one is a uh, two Latino for you. Mm -hmm. uh, T O O underscore 
Latino, it, number for you. You, you've had reported to you that guys have come up and then followed your your advice, your leader, your inspiration and gone out and begotten their Arborist certifications? Yeah, I've had several people this uh, fall, late in the fall, say that they were going to invest their time this winter um, wanting to get certified. And they kind of reached out to me and they were like, can you give me any last minute tips? Or, you know, I've reached out to my local chapter. I've taken the ISA prep class and I want to become certified. And I want you to know that uh, you inspired me to do that. And for those of you that have done that, hey, man, I really appreciate that you want to have reached out to me and done that, but two, that you've uh, taken that to the next level, you know, taking your professionalism to the next level. That's another thing about these conferences. Um, don't be afraid if you're not a certified arborist um, to go to some of these conferences. It's not all, you know, really in-depth technical um, science-based stuff. There's some classes. Uh, I'll shout a guy out right now. His name's uh, Todd Kramer. He's with a large company called Kramer Tree Specialist out of West Chicago, Illinois. And he's actually going through the industry, not only does he teach safety aspects of tree removal, but he's spending a lot of time teaching leadership, leadership classes. So he's trying to show people how to elevate themselves to other levels as well. So, you know, it's very well-rounded. So you might think, well, why am I going to go to a tree conference? I, I don't know about the science behind it. That's not what I want to do. Um, you don't have to take those classes. You could take some of these classes, you know, they bring a lie, they bring a tree in and do a live demonstration where they act. So They'll go, I mean, they go to a tree that's so big that when they cut a part of the tree out, it's like a whole tree on its own. And they bring this thing in, they put it on a stand and they go up in the tree and they talk about rigging techniques, load forces, shock load, all, all this kind of stuff, digging different rigging practices. You can do safety work positioning. You know, that's not anything that's my specialty, but I mean, there's some people in the industry like him that, you know, really give back. But the last thing I went to was a, a talk he did about leadership different, different ways of way, how you can raise yourself, you know, different levels of leadership. So that's pretty important too. In our industry, we talk about bringing people into the industry. You know, we're kind of at a labor shortage in the green industry and in tree work, but what happens when everybody shows up, you know, and you're a really good tree guy, a good climber, or, you know, removal, technical climber doing removals and stuff. And, uh, you're too good to be in the tree anymore. Um, we want to get you in a position of leadership where now you can train other people to be good, to be safe, follow safe practices. So yeah, shout out to him. It's pretty cool to see people like that. And it inspires me to want to, you know, do that in my own, in my own sector that, that I inhabit within the green industry. So yeah, especially, you know, for me, it's more about the landscaper. It's more about the uh, person who manages green spaces. They want to, they want to get into tree work and uh, I saw your books. Oh yeah. My books. So yeah, the Arbor certification manual. This is a great book. I mean, even if you don't want to get certified, but you want to learn some more. And again, I, you know, I'm more speaking to like the, the person who manages green spaces, like a landscaper, perhaps, you know, you just want to learn about more, a little bit more about tree science, plant health care, a little about the safety aspect of things. Now, these are some good books. And again, you know, I go to these conferences to meet the people who write, who write these books, you know, soil management for urban trees, root management. These are good books. And I actually, you know, attended some classes just very recently by the people who actually wrote these books or contributed to that uh, manual right there. There's a lot of good information in there. I encourage you to take the certification uh, test just to test your own knowledge. Does it blow your mind the more and more you learn that there's guys out there running all over the place doing work and collecting money and not even knowing this stuff? Yeah, it is because it's kind of irresponsible in some ways. It is. I like how you're always harping on the, uh, all that extra dirt on top of around the tree. Yeah, that's a big problem. I mean, you got to remember trees. I mean, where do they get their start? I don't know if you can see that, but see all the... And there's a lot of finger pointing in our industry. You know, it's the arborist's fault. It's the landscaper's fault. It's the nursery's fault. I mean, it's production. It's... it's uh, there's a lot of hands that touch things. And if everybody just kind of knows what the other hand's doing a little bit, we can uh, avoid some of the problems that we have out there. So those are called uh, BMPs or best management practices. And there's uh, 12 of them, I believe. And there's ANSI standards that go along with that, with those books. ANSI standards? Yeah. Is that really bad that I've only heard you talk about it, but I don't know what it is? No, a lot of people don't know what it is, but it's basically the standards for our industry. These books are designed to help, you know, it's, it's like the, the, the manual for how to do things properly. Yeah. So you mean being taught by somebody who just knows how to do it and it seems like it's working means that a bunch of good people could be teaching people and it's not even the right way. And it's not way. even the right way to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to remember tree care is very science-based. 
And then there's a whole safety Mm -hmm. side of it as well. So you have a a, a legit multiple six figure business in two states. You got employees, equipment, you got a secretary, you got insurance, you pay taxes, you got all this stuff. I mean, you're you're really out in the field. Dude, you got 25 or 50 quotes waiting on you right now. Yeah. Yeah. We got a lot. We sent out a whole bunch of uh, uh, flyers uh, with uh, uh, plant healthcare estimates for the spring. And there's been a lot of requests. So what makes you different than an average guy who can just show up and cut down a tree? And why should a customer go with a guy like you? And why should guys like us learn some of the things that you know, and and pertaining to caring for the client? Well, we lead with education-based, you know, our initiative is education-based. So if we show up to a property and a tree is just too far gone, and it does need to come down, you can't save every tree. I at least, at least like to, if I can, if I see what happened to the tree or why it's gone into decline and has to be removed, explain to the client why this tree's got to come down. So that if, you know, they're, they're heartbroken a lot of times you say that tree's got to come down. I'm like, man, I planted that tree like 15 years ago when my kid was born. And, you know, it's just starting to provide benefits and shade to my patio. And you're telling me it's got to come down. It's half dead. We can't like fertilize it or something. I'm like, no, it's just, you know, a root problem. It's strangled itself. This is something that could have been fixed, you know, 10 years ago, or it might be showing up on your property that way. So hiring a landscaper who's certified and knows how to, how to install material and stuff is important as well. And at least I can give them all that. So the last thing I want to see is that they had to lose this tree. They go through this traumatic experience. They got to pay all this money. They're going to pay all this money again to have a new tree put in. And if they don't know that there are certain things they need to be looking for, they're going to end up going through this whole process again. Oh, and it's not like man. he lived to be a thousand years old. So, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you really only got two shots. I mean, you a know, tree is actually part of your life. Then it's, yeah, you love trees, don't you? Well, I do love trees, but I love educating people even more about their benefits and the importance of them. Um, you know, when you look at the science part of, of, of the, you know, our canopy in, in the country or in your state or in your locality, and you start really dissecting the numbers, you see how dire things are, especially with, you know, new pests that are coming in and, and you know, invasive species that choke out other trees, you know, like buckthorn, honeysuckle, you know, stuff like this, you know, it gets in a, in a, in a forest preserve and suddenly the, the new oak seedlings can't grow because they're being, you know, overshadowed by these, by these invasive species. And as the bigger oaks start to die off, the ones that should be taking their place never get a shot. You know, people don't realize that because you drive down the road, you see trees, you see green stuff everywhere. And you're like, what's that guy talking about? What's the big deal? There's trees everywhere. But when you look at it from the big picture, not so much. It's kind of like when you look at a topographical map, like flooding is not a big deal until all the snow and ice melts. And then the rains come in the spring and suddenly people in Missouri are like floating around in boats. But when you when you look at the topographical map and you back up and you look at it from the 40,000 foot view, you're like, well, man, they put that whole subdivision in a floodplain just because when they built it, they built the subdivision and built it out. No flood happened. doesn't mean no flood will ever happen again. So it's kind of the same thing with trees. You, you give that 40,000 foot view and you're like, man, if we lose this tree population, cause it's not cared for or that tree population, cause it's not cared for. We've lost so many plus the trees that are just, you see, I get amped up. The trees are getting older. Trees don't live forever. Phys- you know, it's a, a physiological uh, d- organism. Dude, like people, California wildfires. Please talk about that. <sighs> okay, I can't quote anything, you know, a hundred percent, but I do know. Look, there's profit. There's uh, profit and there's a lot of people in dead. California watching right now. There's profit and arson. I mean, the environmental movement, uh, late '60s, '70s, somewhere in there. You know, they were all about not cutting any trees down or doing any kind of logging. That timber harvest was kind of important to kind of keep the forest thinned out. And then when you do have a forest fire, you kind of need to let it burn so that it burns that kindling, you know, the trees that have fallen or, you know, the the, the dried up dead kindling in the woods. You want that to kind of burn itself out because when you don't let it happen, it just builds up. And then we have these super fires. But there's something in there with government and money and Fed funding and all that that let's let's not take care of things and let them get big and then budgets increase for managing these fires and you know these budgets are cyclical and they keep getting the money even if there's not a fire i've 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 read a lot of i've gone down the rabbit hole on the internet quite a few times about that stuff and that it it seems like it's kind of a a thing that's 
could be avoided. Let's say that. Through the lens of being an arborist. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's more forestry, like standing forests. That's not my specialty. So I got to be careful what I say about that. But there's more to this whole forest fire and them getting worse and worse and worse. It could have been probably avoided or made less worse. I get worried about talking. And this about goes the f- all the way back because all the kindling building up. Right. Instead of from a profit standpoint, somewhere in there, there's money being moved back and forth and letting these fires get out of control. It's good for business somewhere. There's some profit in that. And, you know. I never I, even considered that. I, I think that we allow these things to happen, or not us, but the, the powers that be allow these things to happen because there's some, there's some benefit on a monetary standpoint in there. Should I edit this part out or keep it? I don't know. Until we hear the black helicopters buzzing above us. And <laughs> <laughs> you got to be careful what you say. And I, I, there might be some people, and I, and I hope there's somebody in forestry, um, you know, in that side of it, U.S. Uh, Department of Forestry, that maybe will comment and, and set the record straight about that. Or maybe you can, can't speak on that stuff. But there's a lot of publications out there that I've read that talk about this stuff extensively. Publication. Okay, so if a guy is... <sighs> customer the guy's doing the landscape and he's cutting the lawn he's doing what he's doing the customer says can you trim all my trees and the guy says sure first mistake right how i mean if it's the middle of the summer in june and the guy wants to make a couple extra bucks trimming low-hanging branches it's low-hanging oak fruit. tree yeah so or an elm tree mm-hmm. that could be a problem because of, again of disease transmission but maybe he doesn't know that or maybe you got a, gla- a guy who uh doesn't know how to how to use climbing systems and he's using spikes to climb trees that you know those that wounding on the tree can have some severe dire consequences maybe it doesn't kill the tree tomorrow but uh maybe the tree doesn't make it to be 50 years old and only makes it to 25 years old and maybe it's sitting in a backyard that has a low spot and maybe that house has a basement and suddenly that tree has been removed out of that environment and all of a sudden the basement starts flooding because you removed a tree that takes up hundreds of gallons of storm water. So environment and, and climate change plays a big part in this as well. This we guy's like, you're like a tree detective, bro. I like that. I need like a trench coat and a little badge. You do. You got badges all over the place. What do they mean? Well, they're not badges. They're just patches. Just, you know, part of um, showing, you know, the professional organizations I belong to. It's certified arborist patch that you get when you pass your test. That's just the... The International Society of Arborists. You have Arbor two culture. of them. Arbor culture. Yeah. And there's two of them and they look similar. Well, this one's the actual just being a professional member. So you can become a professional member. Anybody can become a professional member of the International Society of Arbor Culture. This is the certified arborist patch. Um, this one on this side is my CTSP. This is certified tree safety professional with the Tree Care Industry Association. And this is a plant health care technician specialist. I just got a new one. Um, qualified crew leader. That's a great class. I recommend anybody that is not yet a certified arborist that wants to go down that path or start expanding their knowledge, reach out to the Tree Care Industry Association, TCIA.org. Uh, they have a whole uh, program that you can go through, different, different uh, special, like learn how to properly run a chainsaw. And you take, the, you take this test, you take a class. Um, there's a patch with it. You get a wallet card that you can carry around. You get a certificate. Um, if you have people working for you, you put them through that program. And it kind of gives them that incentive that they're learning something new. They have something to show for it. And then, and then maybe once you get through that whole Tree Care Academy, they call it, then maybe you take the next step and, you know, you get this, this book and uh, you start learning. Because really, this, this book doesn't teach you everything that you need to know to become a certified arborist. Being a certified arborist is about some practical knowledge as well. So you've got to have some experience, you know, working with trees and tree populations. Um, I remember the Champaign, Illinois uh, summer convention. Conference, summer conference. Conference. Uh, you had a couple of your team members with you, employees, and they were wearing company uniforms. And you, you build that into the company budget to pay for their education and get them absolutely certified arborists. Sure. They must appreciate that. That's cool or what? Yeah, I, I hope they appreciate it. You know, I want them to learn. I, I've been to a lot of stuff and I, I see like the owner of a company and he might only have three or four guys or 10 guys or 20 guys working for him. But, uh, you know, he's the only guy that shows up. He doesn't invest in, in the people who work with him. 
Now, obviously, if it's somebody who just wants to show up to work, they just want to do the job, they're really not interested. Maybe you don't invest in them. Maybe you expose them to it. But if they clearly aren't interested, you can't force them to. But if you have some people working for you that that want to know more, that they, they show you that hunger, they're they're interested, they're willing to attend, they're taking notes in classes, they're not texting on their phone or being on Facebook. You want to invest in these people. You want them want them to learn, and you want them to be a reflection of your culture, your company culture, your business culture. You know who you are as a person. You want to raise people up. So if a guy wants to is watching this right now and he wants to become a certified arborist and it's just inspired, he's like, he's inspired, what are the steps he needs to take and how long from the time he decides and starts taking action to he's actually a certified arborist? And where does he go to get that training? Well, you have to, to be, to be able to sit for the test, you have to have three years of documentable experience first of all. But that doesn't mean you can't start down the journey. So if you have some experience working with trees, let's say you've just been doing it for a year, you really like it, or you're a landscaper who wants to take that extra step. I actually know quite a few landscapers um, who uh, have taken that to the next level. You know, they're just kind of mow and blow kind of guys and maybe some planting, but they want to learn more about the science and they've gone down that, that path as well. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jose Hasso from Blue, Blue Works Landscaping in Illinois has done that as well. But anyway, so you need three years to be able to sit for the test. Uh, you need to apply. It's an online process. You go to isa.org. isa.org. Or arbor.org. We'll put the links in the description below. I can't ever remember off the top of my head. I've got all this stuff saved in my computer. So when I want to go to the ISA site, I just hit that bookmark tab and go. I guess if, if I'm going to do more podcasts and people want to know where to go, I suppose. But, you know, most people just hit the links in the description below anyway. So I don't feel bad that I can't spit it out because if you're not writing it down, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So a tree, what is that like the roots of a tree is as big as the, the tree is above the ground and the drip line and the canopy line? Like how does all that can work? be one and a half times bigger than the drip line? And more than that, it can extend quite a ways out. It depends on the variety. A lot of it's species specific. <sighs> Dude, we did this sod job. And as we were using the sod cutter machine to cut up the old crap grass dying and put new topsoil, like all these little like spider roots from a tree that was over there were all coming up. And I was like, oh, I felt horrible and I didn't know what to do. And I think I called you, man. I was like freaking out. Oh, was this the maple? The maple was in the parkway and you guys took the sod out of the front yard. And then yes. you went to go pick up sod and then the guys... When you came back, you're like, what's this pile of roots doing in the sidewalk? You're like, oh, that was all in the front yard. We had to get rid of all that. Yeah, you called me about that, asked me what was going to happen. What, you know what you need to do? You, I'm sure you know who that was. Go back and look. Go back probably in June and see if you got some early fall coloring happening. happening. See if some stress happened. Uh, take this book and learn what bud scars are. See what kind of growth you got this year. From bud scar to bud scar, you know where your apical growth is. And see if it's grown more. Like, I, feel, I feel bad. I feel horrible. Like, Yeah, taking a rototiller to the yard and chopping up all the roots. Yeah, that's not so I good. mean, the trees here, there's the sidewalk, and then there's the yard over there. But the tree roots went all the way. How deep do the roots go under the ground? Typically, roots go uh, 12 to 18 inches. But, I mean, These some do go the, three feet deep. These are all the surface ones, but still. It, that's and like, there's different kinds of roots. You know, your lateral roots, your feet of roots, your sinker roots. <sighs> yeah. Dude, it's like, that's like you're a whole going class and cutting off time. someone's fingertips or something, right? All right. Well, am I cutting off your fingertips or am I cutting off your arm, like right in the middle of the artery? What's worse? You'll probably live without your fingertips. The tree will probably live without its fingertips, too. Not that it won't have some uh, potential issues. Dude, Stress. The, when I first started, a customer wanted a retaining wall built around a crimson maple tree, <laughs> a huge maple tree. I was like, yeah, we can do it. And you call those tree coffins. Yeah. What's a tree coffin? Oh, a tree coffin really is when you, when you have a tree and like, let's say here, the, here's a flare of the tree, you know, where it, it, it flares out at the bottom, tapers out at the bottom. And then you build like a, a stack wall of block around it. And then you raise it up that much with the block, and then you backfill all that with uh, topsoil mulch. You slowly choke the tree. Yeah. Tree coffin. There's a lot of um, respiration. But what about all the customers? They want level to reach. that happens. Well, that's because they don't know. So you ask me what sets us apart and different from other tree companies. Uh, we lead with that with that uh, education. 
Here's a simple one. Piling mulch. Well, I'll finish what I was going to say, dude. <sighs> I started cutting a trench around the tree and I'm like, these stupid big roots are in the way. And then it kind of hit me. I stopped and I was like, wait a second. <clears throat> it just it like Bruh. I go, what the hell am I doing? And I stopped, dude, and I started doing research, and I realized, oh, my God, I literally could have killed this tree. I could be responsible for so much right now. So that's where a tool like the air spade comes in handy. Pneumatic tool means air blows out, and you blow all that soil around. You make that trench with air. Doesn't hurt the roots. You expose them all, and you figure out, what kind of roots do I have? Can I cut these? And if you if you can cut them, you need to cut them cleanly because you got to be careful. You start whacking away at roots. You don't know if those are the anchor roots. See, and then the tree blows over because you cut all the roots on the west side and it's getting hit with west winds. And there's a house on the east side, a swing set. Summer storm comes up. The wind blows hard. Kids are on a swing set, haven't made it inside the house yet. Tree blows over, falls in the swing set, kills the two, three-year-old twin girls. You think that shit won't come back on you? It'll come back on you. Because they're going to hire somebody who knows about risk assessment and does litigation type work and American Society of Consulting Arborist. And uh, you're going to go to court. And they're going to make you responsible. You're going to pay. Plus, you kill two twin year old tw- twin girls. You didn't want to do that anyway, right? All because you didn't know. You hear that? Okay, so you talk about sneak the vitamins in with the ice cream, make it a fun, entertaining podcast. Edutainment. Edutainment. Well, that's what you do. That's why people watch because it's not constant badgering of information. Yeah, I guess I was trying to just pull as much of that stuff out of you as possible to so when people because I'm like. You're here. You're actually here. And we can get this long form thing and, you know, just get as much value. So people are just like, aha, aha, aha. But you're right. So what about like piling mulch up around trees and landscapers do all the time? I've done it. You know, I know not to do it now. Um, There's a lot of good reasons for the proper application of mulch, three to four inches on a one time application, not three to four inches every year. Because what does mulch turn into? Mulch turns into dirt. It's not good to keep piling dirt up on top of roots they need to breathe they need to get air uh, oxygen so you see the guys packing the mulch up a mulch volcano and they're making it flat and putting all this pride into suffocating a tree right right so the roots can't breathe their roots supposed to go down you know slightly down and out Mm -hmm. and when they can't find any air they end up right against the trunk of the tree and then they start going up plus that's the best growing medium for them Because it's like decayed organic material. You want the material, you want the mulch to decay and then go into the soil and, you know, add some microbial benefits to the soil. You want all that decomposition to happen. Um, And when you pile it up like that, it's, it's too much. You see like 10 inches of mulch on top of a tree. And then next year they put another, you know, three, four inches of mulch and just keep compiling the problem. And then the tree can't breathe. It brings up roots. The roots start to encircle around the base of the tree. And it eventually girdles it and chokes it. And it makes it unsafe. Another thing, as you said, you go into a culture. In Michigan, we have these backyards where all the houses are very close and people want privacy. So they put a whole bunch of Colorado spruces in the backyard, all on berms, piled with the mulch all around them. And all the trees are infected with this white, nasty fungus and dying. And the customer's <laughs> freaking out. Well, yeah, because their tree starts to... to- go into decline and it's a slow process it gets a fungal uh, fungal disease so colorado blue spruce are really native to colorado Uh, they like different soil they like lower humidity and that's not something that we have in the midwest Um, so we find ourselves um, with these fungal problems and then the tree needs to be continually sprayed a lot of times the problem is by the time someone notices that the tree like i couldn't see through the tree and i don't know honey like it's been five years we've lived here and suddenly I can see through the tree and I can see that something's going on with the tree. By then it might be too late. The tree's gone too far into decline. You're just trying to keep it from getting worse, but you may not be able to bring it back. You know, where then you, you know, people think that fertilizing is what needs to happen. You see that a lot in the landscape business and there's high profit margin in fertilization, but uh, without knowing what's going on with the soil, without understanding, you know, tree and plant health you don't really know if it needs fertilizer that may not be the problem you know we get a lot of calls from people that say 
uh, something's going on with this tree. We've been paying XYZ company for the last three years. They've been fertilizing it. doesn't seem to be getting better. The fertilizer could actually make it worse. What's, what's in fertilizer? Salt. High salt content. Could have already stressed the tree even more if it's having problems. So the, so the tree is buried up in mulch. It's suffocating. It's too close to many other trees. It's the wrong species of tree. The environment in the backyard isn't allowing air to circulate properly. So mold is growing and the trees and it's getting probably too much, maybe water. And then probably. they say, oh, we'll just throw fertilizer on it. Yeah, that's not, that's not <laughs> going to help. No, it's an abiotic problem. So there's biotic, which is like insects and diseases. And then there's abiotic, which would be like walling off a backyard full of uh, conifers, you know, evergreens, and then planting other trees with inside that area that need to be able to breathe, like crab apples. And next thing you know, you've got apple scab running ampent, uh, leaves falling off of crab apples. Because the whole backyard becomes a Petri dish. Uh, Pretty much, yeah. You create your own micro environment, microclimate. Wow. I wouldn't even have thought of to even ask these questions if it wasn't for you. So what do you do? Do you come in and just like pull all that mulch away, allow the trees to breathe, prune everything out? That's the what? first thing we start with. Yeah. So if somebody calls and they say that they've got this area of trees they are not looking good. That's the first thing we prescribe. If we notice that that's one of the, the factors. Now, if, if it's got a nice uh, root flare and it's not buried in mulch, you know, then we start checking within that drip line. Maybe it's just compacted. Maybe the soil is poor. You know, the soil's been compacted. Has there been any construction activity lately at your house? You know, has that addition always been there since you've lived here? Or was that part of the house? Or, you know, you, you got to ask questions. So the detective work of tree work is really important. And without some of that extra science-based knowledge, it's hard to do that. It's like when people call and they say, my tree hasn't looked good for the last couple of years. Not sure what I should do. So I start asking questions. How long do you plan on living here? Is this your forever house? I look at the person, they seem to be about my age. I'm thinking, you know what? This is an older, you, you bought this house. You inherited a tree that was already 20, 30 years old in the wrong spot. It's kind of used up. It's, it's useful life. It's, it's kind of going out the door. So in spend, instead of spending all this money to keep it on life support, maybe we need to take it out and uh, replant it with a better species, especially if you're going to live here for a while. You know, you're going to get to enjoy the benefits, watch it grow. Plus, it's just better for the environment all, all you know, overall. Now, there's other cases where, um, you know, someone's bought a home and it's an area with uh, um, oaks and they're big, and maybe a couple hundred years old. And maybe a neighbor has put in a new driveway and has ripped up some roots and they share this tree, you know, and they're, they, they want to keep it going. So maybe we need to do some some work to it. So when you walk on someone's property, all this stuff, you could just, I mean, I talk about this, taking an IQ test and I started looking into it and some, there's a rare type, a more rare, less common type of uh, IQ that people have really high Q in. And that is comes to, um, you know, not spatial intelligence or like emotional intelligence, but there's one that is, uh, it's like a biological, it's a, it, it's a gift of nature. Like some people are just nature nature path. I don't know what it's called, but they look at nature and they can see all these symbiotic relationships just by looking out at, you know, trees and nature and you can see patterns and all that stuff. And when you talk about it, it's almost like it's completely, uh, can you talk about something like that? Have you developed that? Where was that like a gift? Is this, I think it's just an accumulation of knowledge and then, you know, and with passion for it, you know, I always say that, you know, uh, trees saved my life. Because if I wouldn't uh-huh. have got into this business, so it's deeper for me. I mean, it's a, it's a passion for me. It's what you know what I love to do. I'd, I'd probably do it for free if I could. It's just something that I really enjoy doing. So um, I don't know if everybody else shares that. You know. So what kind of money can people make? Uh, what's wh- what are the benefits aside from you know being a proactive steward of the urban environment? But what about the financial rewards or separating yourself or? Well, right now I'm only making sixteen million dollars a year. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It really, it really depends. It depends what your specialties are. It depends, uh, you know, how much value you can bring. Did you say with your air spade? I mean, I know it's an expensive thing and you're going to be teaching people how to do this, but I mean, uh, you pull up with this machine and you do all this and you're in and out in like 45 minutes. You charge like, I don't know, what is it like 450 bucks or something? I don't know. I don't want to talk about prices. No? No. Oh, okay. Well, I don't remember I, exactly what it is anyways, but I, I'm just... 
several hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. It depends. It it really depends case by case on what the price structure is going to be. And it depends on your business. You know, some of the bigger companies that have uh, higher uh, expenditures, they, they have to do it for twice as much as I do it. Mm-hmm. You know, my business model is, is, is kept in a way that I can do it for what I do it for. Everybody's going to be different. Because everybody is different. Right. Like, okay. I, we own our compressor. You know, um, we have our own compressor. A lot of people have an airspace tool, but they have to go out and rent the air compressor, which adds a whole nother level of costs to it. So they're going to be more expensive than us. You guys are going to see the video. I'm going to put a link in the description below of the vlog that we we filmed him in Champaign, Illinois, doing a root collar excavation with this tool. It's like totally sweet. And I never thought that stuff existed when I just, you know, meet my guy and my tree guy friends who like cut down and trim trees and stuff that this is entirely different. And all that stuff's important, too. I want to make sure that people know that if you're like a technical climber and you come across this video and you watch that, I mean, that's, that's a whole world unto itself. That It's like being a doctor, you know, ear, nose, and throat, uh, podiatry, you know, it, it's all these specialties. They're all doctors, but they're all specialists. And my hat's off to the guys that do the climbing, the technical climbing. Man, there's just some guys that just, they just throw all these parts together um, the Illinois Tree Climbing Championship, if that's not something you've been to, that's sponsored by the Ar- Illinois Arborist Association. That is just so wicked cool, man, to watch these guys just fly around trees. And when they do the competition and the technical stuff that they do, and every guy's kind of got his own thing, the rule book you have to follow. I mean, it's, it's a whole thing. And if you're into climbing, make that your specialty. You know, be, go technical. I mean, these guys are awesome to watch. It's a science unto itself. They may not be big on the science part of it, but that doesn't make them any better or less than me or whatever. Just everybody has their own specialty. It's awesome. So you're quickly rising up as an influencer. A lot of people are watching you now, and it's just you have this magnetic personality, your passion about trees, the things you post on Instagram. Um, where, where do you uh, see this kind of going? Because you're getting invited to speak at different conferences. and Yeah, getting invited to speak, to teach, um, really uh, to inspire others to get into the industry. Um, you know, I've, I've got a, an affinity toward, you know, Latinos. And I, there's not really that many who are maybe second, third generation Latinos that really have someone to follow and, and lead them. And I kind of want to fill that, that void for them. Um, I think I might have avoided a lot of problems early on in my career. If maybe I would have had a little bit of that influence myself, it's important. You know, people gravitate to those uh, of likeness. Um, so I'd like to fill that void. Uh, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, it's like Spanish based. It's just maybe that that sector, that culture, that community is, gra- you know, gravitate a little more. That's um, awesome. So that's important. Yeah. You just showed me a, a magazine uh, before we started the podcast. Open it up and you had two full pages all about you. Three. Well, not just me, just, you know, my company um, mm-hmm. and my business partner. Uh, he's in there, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was about the certified tree safety professional and how we use that safety training uh, in the nursery part of it. Because the nursery industry doesn't really have its own like safety structure. Mm-hmm. They do for like greenhouse production and all that. But uh, digging trees, when you're using the tree spades and you're digging these big holes, um, you know, you're out in fields. A lot of time it's in rural areas. You're far away from the hospitals or any, any kind of emergency care. You're dealing with smaller trees that you're in very close proximity to when you're like tying up branches, when you're tying up the heads so they can be put on a truck and shipped away. Um, It's very easy to get poked in the eye. So simple things like wearing ear protection. If you're driving um, skid steers, like our operators drive skid steers with tree spades, it's very loud, loud environment. They might be on those things for, you know, seven, 10 hours a day. And that constant humming, you know, I've met a lot of people in this industry who, from running chainsaws their whole life to operating bulldozers their whole, whole life, who don't wear those earmuffs mm-hmm. and they destroy their hearing. You know, you see the old timers wanting to teach the class mm-hmm. and they're up there in front of the class. And could you, you know, and somebody has a question and like, can you repeat the question? Like everybody heard it, but him. And he'll be very honest to say, my hearing's shot. That's why I'm having this class. Wear your earring protection. Oh. Got to got to cover your ears, man. You lose your hearing, you're done. So, just like guys with injuries, you know, a lot of climbers who, uh, you know, they get up, they get out of bed, they get in their truck, they hit their cup of coffee, their cigarette, and up, up the tree they go. There's no stretching beforehand, um, none of that kind of stuff. There's no warming up. 
that all works when you're like 25 years old. And then you wake up one day when you're 47, like me, and you're like, why does this arm hurt? Why does this leg hurt? Because yeah. you did something when you were 25 because you just got up and ran. So that's where personal development comes in. I know you do a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Kind of get up a little bit earlier in the morning so that you take that time to get your mind right. You know, open up your your mind, get your body moving a little bit, maybe hit the gym a little bit, go for a run on the block, whatever, and get your body just prepped and primed and oiled up and your mind right. So you go. So you avoid injuries and getting hurt. That thing is amazing. What is that, that tree on your neck? Oh, my medallion. It's actually, um, it's a, a magnifying glass. So there's a, a magnifying glass in here. And like that saying, you can't see the forest through the trees. So I know when you put it up close to your eye, you don't even notice. Cool, cool. We had some breakthroughs today. Yeah, we were on the whiteboard before the uh, podcast here just talking about kind of psychology, neuroscience, and having breakthroughs, personal breakthroughs in order to have professional breakthroughs. So when you ask, like, what what is all this culminating to? Very similar to what you're doing in the landscape industry. You're, wake, you're awakening people's consciousness, and you're working with a group of people in a specific sector, like the landscaping industry. So I kind of like to do the same thing. This is a, 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 an audience in this sector and kind of bringing that same awareness to people as well. That's kind of where I'm, where I'm going with the whole thing. You ever think about doing a podcast? You could just do it into your phone while you're driving. I have thought about doing a podcast, but you know, I want to do it like you. I think it's cool to have somebody come in. You, you really did a lot of work on the studio. It looks really good. This took a long, 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 long time to finally make this happen right here. It was an idea in my head five years ago, but I mean, I mean, you go spend thousands of dollars in equipment and go stage out a whole studio and lights and say, I'm going to dedicate this room to this and start doing that. I mean, I hope people picked up on that nugget. This was an idea and something you started five years ago. The actions and decisions you make three to five years or today will culminate in something three to five years from today. So this is not an accident. This wasn't something he just woke up one day three weeks ago and decided to do. This was a process he started five years ago. It takes time. You've got to understand that a lot of this stuff takes time. Becoming a certified artist takes time. You don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go do that without it being a process. But you do have to, at some point, commit to wanting to do something and then going down that process. Just understand it could be three to five years before things materialize and come to fruition. Absolutely. You want to end with that? You got anything else you want to say? Because I think that was good. Keep doing the awesome work that you're doing. And I appreciate uh, a lot of the people that reach out to me. Um, my, my phone goes off a lot more than it ever has before. Uh, a lot of people asking for questions. Uh, I apologize to those of you I don't respond to right away. It, it, it's, I'll be honest with you, it's getting a little hard to manage. Oh, bro, dude, you're busy. And, you know, across multiple social media platforms, like my Twitter was dead. I don't post a lot on Green Extraction Company's Twitter page, but I'm starting to get, you know, a lot of interaction there as well. So more industry people on that platform. It's a little more professional over there. Same with LinkedIn. I'm getting a lot more growth on LinkedIn. I'm trying to use that platform a little bit more. Facebook can have, you know, that drama associated with it. I'm in some pretty good tree groups on uh, Facebook, and there's tens of thousands of people in these Facebook groups, but there's a lot of drama back and forth, a lot of name calling, you know. Oh, that was stupid. You know, some guy will post a picture, and you'll say, don't judge me going into it. Don't judge me. I don't know any better. What do you think about this system or setup that I'm using? And man, the first 10 comments are so <laughs> guy, You're an idiot. You're dumb. You're stupid. Why did you do that? You should go work for someone. I'm mean, just, it's a land based thing. It's like, man, just show a cat some love. God, why you gotta just beat on people? That shit burns my ass like a midget with a lighter. Ah, okay. Get that? So, <laughs> did I offend anybody out there who's like a small stature? Saying midget, midget's like a bad word. I don't know. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Sorry. Bless you. No, this I has don't. been a layback chill podcast. When you came over, we were all fired up and passionate, but now this is just chill. We were like the space shuttle challenger. We like took off hard fast this morning. <laughs> Had got on the whiteboard. You did already several um, recordings yourself and, content for the future good stuff he's going to put out some really good stuff deep 
deep. So that's the kind of stuff that you need to listen to. Like when you, it's a rain day and you have that rain day off and your girl goes to work. You don't have the kids if that's your life or whatever. It's just you by yourself. You're like, what am I going to do today? Don't turn on the TV. Consume some of this good content that Keith's got. Put yourself in that state of mind. Use that day that you're off to learn yourself something. Well, that would be some more I am ability stuff. But this video that, that channel, did, I see that ch that that channel is growing. The I am ability channel on YouTube. That my is, other channel. Well, I needed a place to put the content that I wasn't putting on this channel because I had to talk about certain just deep psychological breakthrough type stuff. That, uh, that but it all tie it all ties into this stuff. It all ties into this stuff. You know, again, this is like uh, being an arborist or or arbor culture or tree work. Um, it, it, it all ties in together. You know, a lot of times um, I'll say that tree work is great for that angry young man. There's no place better than to be up in a tree if, you've, if you're like an angry young man because you're in control of your environment. No one's really telling you. Because I know a lot of tree guys who are angry young men, some old angry men too up in trees. But, you know, there, there's just a certain sense of freedom up there. Oh, dude, when you're up in a tree, you're the boss. Man. Right. And I, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a climbing arborist. I have um, been up in a tree. I have climbed. I've been taught by um, one of the best when it came to going up in a tree. Um, and uh, it's a great place to be, to feel free to kind of uh, separate yourself from everything going on. Maybe you're working with just one or two people, you know, you're putting your life in their hands, you're developing the beginning stages of how to communicate, develop relationships. And most people who like myself, who came from a, a troubled background, that's what the problem was. Didn't know how to communicate, didn't know how to relate to other people. And this kind of work, if you find yourself up in the canopy of a tree, you have to do that because your life depends on it. Life or death, yeah. Sure. So it, it's a good place, again, for an, it's a good place for anybody. But, you know, especially if you're an angry young person or you're having some problems, um, maybe you're on probation like I was and someone's coming to you and they're saying, you know, you got people problems. You know, you got people skill issues. You got anger management issues. I'm not saying go be a problem for somebody, you know, so you, you want to, you want to be cognizant and aware that maybe you have these issues, but maybe look at this industry as a place to go that you can throw yourself into something um, that you really got to be responsible for yourself and then responsible for other people as well. And again, that's where this leadership kind of stuff comes in, you know, and uh, like I said, my, my buddy Todd uh, Kramer does a, a, a lot of teaching on trying to do that. So that's, that's Todd really Kramer. Yeah. With Kramer tree specialist. I just, I follow Sweet. him because I, I really like what he's doing in the industry. He Sweet. does the same thing. He's trying to elevate people's uh, consciousness in what they're doing. I like it. And developing leaders. That's important. So you don't want to just bring people into a business and have them doing stuff. If you're not going to take them as far as you can. Very smart. So how can people find you again? Facebook, uh -huh. Instagram, I'm sure you'll put all the links in the description below. I love saying that now. Yeah. Yeah. I did a video with Stanley at the uh, um, Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. Stan Genetic. Yeah. It's funny. A friend of mine was there and she called him Mr. Monkey. Because I told her it was Stanley Genetic with Dirt Monkey University and she couldn't remember anything but Dirt Monkey and she didn't know what to call him. So she goes, Mr. Monkey's coming over here. I was like, I don't know if he's going to like that. But he did the whole thing. So we're doing a video and he's like, I'm going to put the link in the description below. And she's like, what is he pointing to? I'm like, when you watch the video, you'll see. But I've gotten used to saying, I'll put the link in the description below. Yep. It sounds better than when people say the link will be up here somewhere. I think it's behind my head. No, I hate that. You never do that. Right, it's like it's right down there. You see it? It's right there. Exactly. Okay. Thanks for being on the show. You can find this podcast not only here on this video, but on SoundCloud. On in any of your favorite podcast apps, go to KeithKelfis.com and go over to the podcast tab. It'll pop up a page where you can click your favorite podcast, iTunes, Speaker, SoundCloud, anything, and you can listen to it while you work. Please hit the subscribe button, share this video with somebody else if you think it'll create value for them, and check the links in the description below. Peace.